a landmark 30-year deal between Singapore and the U.S. to deepen cooperation in nuclear technology. It will allow the two countries to share expertise to support clean energy needs. For more analysis on nuclear energy in Singapore's future, I'm now joined by Dr. David Broadstock, Senior Research Fellow and Energy Transition Lead at the Sustainable and Green Finance Institute at NUS. Dr. Broadstock, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Shada. Um, first off, how big of a deal is this? The fact that Singapore and the US have entered into this agreement to uh, deepen nuclear cooperation and facilitate knowledge transfer? It's a big deal, mm -hmm. I think. The agreement is important in two regards. It's important domestically because we still have a need to decarbonize by 2050. And we have plans and documents which lay out pathways which we might explore to decarbonize the power sector, which include potentially nuclear. Mm. It, this is not a commitment to deploy nuclear locally, but it's a, a, a doorway to the information which would be necessary to do that with the best possible technologies. In addition to the domestic benefits, there's also the regional cooperation benefits. To be clear, though, the Singapore government says it has not decided whether to pursue nuclear power. But by gaining access to US nuclear info and expertise, this agreement opens a whole new door for Singapore towards nuclear energy, doesn't it? It does, and, and, and it also does so, it helps in the way that Singapore will position within the region as well. So, so I think the important thing here is that other countries within the region have already signed the partnership, the agreement with the US, and they're able to exchange dialogue on the latest technologies. And without Singapore signing, we can't join those conversations. Mm. And so it's not just about what can we do for Singapore domestically, but it's how can Singapore be at the forefront of the discussions to design the best possible solutions for the region? Yeah. OK, I would like to zoom in on one type of technology that's creating all the buzz these days, the small modular reactors. Uh, they are promising to be safer to build and safer to operate. Let's listen to this report by our reporter, Nashra Rohim. Most of us know what a conventional nuclear plant looks like. A massive facility with tall, cooling towers. Plants like these use large traditional nuclear reactors, each with the capacity to produce more than 700 megawatts of electric power. That's enough to light about 70 million LED bulbs. It's very hard to imagine having such a reactor, you know, on the Singapore uh, uh, island. But small modular reactors may offer a more flexible option. Compact enough to be housed in buildings, these advanced designs will need less space, emit less heat and hence require less cooling water. They can produce less than half the power of their large conventional counterparts, but they are potentially safer and offer more flexibility. It will have passive safety, uh, which will allow, you know, for residual heat removal, because even when a reactor has been stopped, uh, it still produces you know, heat uh, from the radioactivity of the fission product. I think it allows also for a better integration you know, on multi-vector grades. So in that sense, it's, uh, especially in the Singapore context, you know, there is more flexibility, uh, which is well suited for uh, complementing uh, renewable energies. Research and development is largely still ongoing. But if and when they become commercially available, these more advanced nuclear designs that can be more than 10 times the size of a full-grown man could be a game-changer in how land-constrained cities power themselves. So, Dr. Broadstock, do you foresee these small modular reactors being potential game-changers uh, when it comes to land-constrained countries adopting nuclear power? Uh, I think they are potential game changers. The small modular reactors have been designed, these, these latest generation, the fourth generation of nuclear reactors, they've been designed with safety in mind, given some of the bad experiences we've had in the past with Fukushima, Chernobyl, uh, mm -hmm. and places like this. And it's going to be very important for us to try to understand and communicate to society 
just how different the technologies are and the risks that might be associated with them are. Because mm. this will be a very important factor in changing the possible social acceptability, not just within Singapore, but within the region more generally. Where then should a nuclear facility be sited in cities that are densely populated onshore or offshore and how away, uh, how far away should it be from the population? You always want to have the power generation a certain distance from the population. Power generation is a process which can have its, its dangers and consequences. The opportunity with the small modular reactors is to explore the floating and offshore facilities which which can negate the need to consider the proximity to people and buildings, mm. which, which is a very interesting prospect and, and part of what makes these newer, small reactors so much of a different thing compared with anything that's been explored previously. What about all the nuclear waste generated? If we were to pursue nuclear mm -hmm. power, where would or should the radioactive waste go? Most likely we'd look to partner with our neighbours for something like this. Singapore simply doesn't have many parcels of land where it would be suitable to, to contain any waste, even if the radioactive uh, properties of that waste are far lower than others. Mm. So that's where we'd be probably looking to partner with others in the region that are already testing nuclear, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines. So we were talking about the risks earlier. How do we balance all of those risks with our energy needs, Dr. Broadstock? Mm. Um, very carefully, very mm. simply. Uh, so our energy needs are significant and we have to continue to explore nuclear because we are not, it's not very clear that other solutions such as hydrogen are more attractive just yet. Um, so balancing the risks uh, against the opportunities and the necessity will be mm. the task. And if or when that decision is made, how will all of this affect you know, your commercial consumers and households even? Hopefully, within the long run, what we'll see is uh, good, stable electricity prices, something we've, we've uh, experienced in recent months has been some instability. Uh, nuclear provides very stable levels of energy, so it, it helps regulate the price. And these newer technologies, the costs of using them will come down over time. And with rising carbon prices, the alternatives that we have in place today will continue to become more expensive. So in the long run, the transition to a more balanced fuel mix should benefit all. All right, Dr. Broadstock, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. That was David Broadstock, Senior Research Fellow and Energy Transition Lead at the Sustainable and Green Finance Institute at NUS. Thank you. Staying on news from the U.S. Secretary of State's visit to Singapore, Mr. Antony Blinken says his country is stepping up its alliances and partnerships in the Asia-Pacific in a dialogue moderated by Singapore Ambassador-at-Large Chan Heng Chi. Mr. Blinken also spoke about the value of American leadership and whether things may change with the upcoming U.S. presidential election. In recent times, the Biden administration seems to have worked a lot on creating minilaterals to meet your security objectives. Quad, AUKUS, then you've expanded and uh, deepened, renewed your relationship, the security relationship with Japan and Korea. And that is the Australia, Japan, Philippines and US grouping which was formed for maritime cooperative activity. What is the place of multilaterals in U.S. strategic thinking? There are two things that I think motivate us profoundly. One is that there is uh, a premium, I think, on American engagement, American leadership. Certainly it's one that makes sense for us, but I also believe it makes sense for countries around the world. If we're not engaged, if we're not leading, then probably someone else is, and maybe not in a way that advances the interests and values that, that we have and that we share with Singapore. Maybe just as bad no one is, and then you're going to have a vacuum that's filled by bad things before it's likely filled by good things. But the flip side of that coin is that I think there's a greater premium now than there's been at any time in the 30 or so years that I've been doing this on cooperation, on collaboration, on bringing common approaches to what are 
shared challenges. The multilateral system is one key vehicle for doing that. And I think you've seen our re-engagement across that system, even as we've also been reinvigorating alliances and partnerships. Secretary, you have uh, given us the vision, but the security vision, the alliance, hmm. the partnership uh, vision of the Biden administration for the Indo-Pacific. What is the place of trade in that vision? Hmm. Trade is critical. It uh, links countries, it links people, uh, it links uh, economies. But there's something else that's important to keep an eye on. Um, trade is vital, so is investment. Right now, the United States is overwhelmingly the leading provider of foreign direct investment in Singapore by, I think, five times the next nearest country. At the same time, uh, we're also the biggest provider of foreign direct investment across all of the ASEAN countries. The United States also happens to be the biggest recipient of foreign direct investment. Why is that important? Because you don't let these investments don't happen unless there's a certain amount of trust uh, and also unless there's a certain amount of optimism about the future. I think we see in the magnitude of foreign direct investment a tremendous amount of trust between the United States, Singapore, countries in, in ASEAN, a tremendous amount of trust in the United States and confidence that this is where the future is. Now, I'd like to switch the uh, discussion to the United States. You know, there's a lot of noise coming out <laughs> of the presidential campaign. Really? I hadn't, I hadn't heard any of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you give us an idea of where the United States as a country, a great power, a superpower stands in terms of engagement with the world, with trade, a defense ally, and as a global policeman? I think that there are a number of constants that don't fundamentally change, irrespective of, uh, of who wins a particular election. One is that if you look at um, most of the, uh, the polling, if you listen to our, our fellow citizens, um, they actually want the United States to be engaged in the world. Uh, they understand that um, in order to actually get things done at home, we also have to be working with others uh, around the world. And that remains by far the majority opinion. They strongly prefer that the United States not engage um, uh, the world al alone. Uh, they, want, they, they know the benefits in partnerships, in alliances. Uh, and again, that's a constant. And I think that remains no matter what. The, the flip side is equally important. What I'm hearing is I have the great honor of going around the world on behalf of the United States is that most countries actually want us engaged. Yeah. Uh, they want our leadership. They want our partnership. And that's a very positive uh, signal that resonates back in the United States. Singapore and the U.S. will be expanding cooperation in new areas, including artificial intelligence and civilian nuclear energy. Prime Minister Lawrence Wong says this will help Singapore keep track of emerging technologies and better assess future energy possibilities. Now, he made the comments in a, sp a social media post after his meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Mr. Wong adds that Singapore's bilateral relations with the U.S. is in excellent shape. He says the two countries have substantial ties across many areas, including the economy, defense and security. Mr. Wong says he looks forward to strengthening partnership with the U.S. both bilaterally and with ASEAN.